Welcome to Somaris. A unique example of an Edwardian house, garden, and farm, and just the place for a perfect day out. A visit to Somaris is to explore an earlier time. It was here that the first settlers set up home and shows how colonial pastoral families lived, loved, worked and played. From modest beginnings to the jewel in the crown, Somera's homestead itself, the house that assured this property's place in history for all to enjoy. But it could have been a different story. When Elsie White died in 1981, it ended an era. There was discussion amongst the family as to what to do with the unique collection of period furnishings and family possessions that Elsie had maintained throughout her long life. Eventually, the descendants offered the property to the National Trust of Australia. It was a daunting task for the Trust but with the help of volunteers, the property was opened to the public in 1984. Henry Dumeric and his brother William first settled the area in 1834. They sent stock beyond the boundaries of official settlement, dispersing the original occupants, the Aboriginal people known as the Yaniwan. They established a head station and called it Somaras. The name originates from the Channel Islands, where it's both a place name and a family name associated with the Jumerics. Initially, Somaras was a squatting run of 100,000 acres, for which Henry held a 10 pound grazing license from 1837. The Jumerics built a slab house and huts, a store, wool sheds, and a wash pool. Henry died a year later, and the property was then managed by his brother William. By 1846, Somaras carried 15,000 sheep and 1,600 head of cattle. In 1856, the property was sold to Henry Arding Thomas. Thomas and his wife Caroline were the first owners to live on site. They had six children and lived in the timber cottage previously built by the Jumerics for their managers. All that remains of that house are French doors and a mantelpiece. They later added a three-roomed brick extension to their home, the last real physical evidence of their time here. In 1874, Henry Thomas sold the station to Francis White of Musselbrook, and the Thomas family moved nearer to Sydney. The following year, Francis died unexpectedly so the family passed on the responsibility for running the property to Francis John, F.J. White, his eldest son, then in his early 20s. Six years later, in May 1881, F.J. White brought his new bride, Margaret Fletcher, known as Maggie, to live at the property. They moved into the same slab cottage that the Thomas family had occupied. It was here that five of their seven children were born. Life by this time was significantly easier. Armadale had grown into a prosperous centre with expanding services in transport, banking, medicine, law and education. FJ had a considerable workload looking after the running of Somaras and their other properties. These stones marked the site of his office, which had a commanding view of operations. By 1887, it was time for a new home. F.J. asked Maitland architect J.W. Pender to draw up plans for a single-storied house. The following year, the White family moved into their new home, where two more children were born. Maggie then devoted more of her time to other interests and responsibilities, including entertaining and, in particular, gardening. Somaras and other white properties took most of F.J.'s time. In 1905, Maggie and daughter Joan travelled abroad on an extended tour of Britain and Europe. 
While they were away, FJ asked the original architect to add a second storey to the house. Completed in 1906, the new Sommerers homestead was a much grander and more comfortable home. It had modern innovations such as acetylene gas lighting, a hot water system and indoor toilets. FJ entered the house through the washroom when he came in from the paddocks. The family would come together for dinner, their main meal, which was served in the middle of the day. Of interest in this room are the Scottish engravings which show animals used in farming or hunting, subjects that no doubt appealed to FJ White. There is also a Russian samovar, which the ladies used as a tea urn, and the room is notable for its marvellous Art Nouveau Wunderlich pressed metal ceilings. The meals were prepared in the nearby kitchen and scullery by the cook and house staff. The laundry has a wood-fired copper for heating water which was lit by the yardman every morning. There is also a mangle on the bench for smoothing sheets and another on the tub for wet washing. The more modern washing machine arrived in the 1950s. The china in the house is both ornamental and for everyday use. The collection includes work by Merrick Boyd of the well-known artistic family and other ceramics by Australian potters. The homestead was largely self-sufficient and this included the making of butter in the dairy. The playroom dates from 1889 and was where the seven children were given lessons by a governess. Stuck to the wall are fragments of a newspaper supplement showing the Armidale streetscape before cars arrived. Maggie's influence is seen throughout the house. For example, in the drawing room, there are many chairs to accommodate visitors. There's also a model of a bullock team made by the Gore sisters from nearby Urala and given to the family as a present. The models are made of wax and have real bullock hair attached. At the back of the room, you can see an old stain above the fireplace. This was caused by honey from a disturbed beehive produced when the fire was lit. FJ's office was the only room in the house where he was allowed to smoke. The room is kept as it was, with some of his favourite objects. A carved chain made from a single block of wood and his collection of bird's eggs. The pictures in the room show members of the White families and homes and buildings associated with them. The family bedrooms were relatively modest. This was the room of Frank White, the youngest son. This is in contrast to the guest rooms and the parents' bedroom, which had the best and most expensive furniture. Somers became a social hub and tennis played an important role. The girls represented Armadale in the Country Week Tennis Championships for a number of years and the family court was a favourite meeting place for practice and socialising. A favourite sport of the sons was polo. In their later years, FJ and Maggie were looked after by their daughters and a friend of the family. This would have been their bedroom, although there's no double bed, as Elsie later used this room after the death of her parents. Here is Maggie's dressing table set, as well as her hat pins. Much of the furniture was a wedding present and came from the retailer David Jones. After their parents' death, Mary and Elsie, who both never married, continued to live in the house. Mary became mistress of the house. She created a remarkable English-style cottage garden with intricate paths, trellises, and flower beds. She had many artistic friends, both in Sydney and locally, and created with her sisters many examples of chipwork wood carving that can be seen throughout the house. She also collected art by emerging painters of the day. 
An example of the woodwork is the chair in the small guest room that was originally part of a whole dining suite completed by the New South Wales Society of Arts and Crafts in 1907, of whom Frida White was a member. The suite was exhibited in Melbourne and London. This tall display cabinet was completed by Mary. It houses the girls' medal and badge collection given to them by World War I soldiers. During the war, the girls volunteered their services at Bulamimba, the home of their cousins, that had been turned into a Red Cross convalescent home during the war. Mary was also a keen seamstress and a prolific photographer who did her own developing. She was also renowned for her involvement with the Country Women's Association, which she founded locally in 1926. She frequently travelled abroad, representing the CWA. Her sister Elsie was different, much more at home with the daily routines of life on the property. She was a keen animal lover and an expert horsewoman. Down in the stable, you'll find her intricately stitched side saddle and other objects related to her riding. She largely managed the property and ensured that her father's practices and standards were maintained. Though Elsie had her own bedroom, she and her younger sisters preferred to sleep on the veranda for the fresh air. She mainly used her room to dress and we see many pictures of horses. There are also some charming ceramics by the Australian potter Theodora Cowan showing native flora and fauna. Also in Elsie's bedroom is a plaque commemorating the New State Movement, whose aim was for New England to become an independent state. Elsie and her father in particular were keen supporters of this cause. By the end of World War II, it was difficult to find staff to work in the house. And after Mary's death in 1948, Elsie White largely lived alone at Somera's. She resisted change in the routines of house and property, and few furniture or furnishings were changed or given away. This room was originally a bedroom used by the family for many years as a storage area. Here, FJ's wheelchair can be seen, as well as the Edwardian wallpaper that in earlier times would have decorated the whole house. Elsie was defiant to the end. Her last years were spent in this room, which was both her sitting room and her final bedroom. Elsie died in December 1981. It was the end of an era. With the National Trust taking over the homestead section of the property in 1984, a new lease of life and purpose was given to Somera's. Nowadays, it's once again become a focal point in the district for such events as weddings, tour groups, farm days and conferences. So after all your energetic explorations of the property, why not come back to the reception centre where the cafe will be serving delicious light lunches and of course Devonshire teas. The shop is adjacent where you can buy books, plants and locally made craft items. We would like to thank you for visiting Somera's and supporting the work of the National Trust. And we look forward to seeing you again soon.